Hi and welcome to a read through of the Unified Biology paper from June 2017. The goal of this read through is to help you understand how to approach the questions, how you should have phrased the answers and some of the theory behind your answers. Let's get on with the paper. Question one begins with a relatively simple question about amino acid structure. So they show the structure of an amino acid leucine, and then they ask you to draw a circle around the R group of leucine. Amino acids all have the same structure. They have a amine group, which contains the nitrogen. They have a central carbon. They have a carboxylic acid group. And then they have an R group. And in humans, that's one of 20 groups, and it gets the letter R. Now, if we had a very simple amino acid, in fact, the simplest, we might have a hydrogen, which would be glycine. Therefore, the R group would be this part here. So looking at leucine, the R group is here. And the examiner just wanted to draw you to draw a circle around that R group. And this is what they wanted in the mark scheme. Students used thin layer chromatography to separate leucine from other amino acids. The chromatogram they produced is shown in figure 1.2. And here's leucine, and here are the two other amino acids, X and Y. The way chromatography works is that you put the amino acids here, at the origin and then you have a solvent and the solvent rises through the chromatogram and the degree of solubility of the amino acid and the degree of adsorption with the stationary phase determines how far it moves so we can see that leucine has moved further from the origin than what x and Y has moved the least distance. Now the solvent front is important because we're going to use that in a minute to calculate the relative front, that is the relative distance that the um, amino acid has traveled relative to the movement of the solvent front. So what can you conclude about the chemical properties of leucine and amino acid X? So leucine and amino acid X have moved about the same distance from the origin through the chromatogram. So we can conclude that the solubility and the adsorption in the stationary phase of leucine and X are about the same. Now this is a two mark question, so we need to also then go on to say, well, the only difference between leucine and amino acid X is the nature of the R group. So they must have chemically similar R groups if they've moved the same distance. So what they were looking for you to say here was that the solubility or the adsorption or the interactions with the stationary phase are the same for both X and leucine. Therefore, they must have similar R groups or chemically similar R groups because the interactions are the same. Amino acid Z was in the mixture analysed by the students. It's not shown in the chromatogram. Z has an RF value that is 0.2 lower than that of Y. They ask you to place a dot on the chromatogram to show the distance moved by amino acid Z. So what they're asking you to do is to place a dot somewhere from the origin to the solvent front. Now I've put in the picture so it's easier for me to show the calculations. So how do you calculate this? Well, you know that amino acid Z has an RF value that's 0.2 lower than amino acid Y. So the first thing you have to do is to calculate the RF value of amino acid Y. Now the RF value is the distance that the spot has moved relative to the front. So for amino acid Y, we can see that the distance of the solvent front is five centimeters. Now this value is the same for all of your calculations. 
y has moved two and a half centimeters. So the RF for y is two and a half divided by five, which gives us 0.5. Then we know that z has an RF value is 0.2 lower than y. So the next step is to take 0.2 away from 0.5, which gives us 0.3. Then we need to know that 0.3 is the distance moved by z, the distance moved by the spot, divided by the solvent front, which is five centimeters. So we know that 0.3 is something divided by 0.5. So we just need to rearrange the equation and multiply 0.3, which is the RF value for z, because it is 0.5 minus 0.2, and then multiply that by five. So 0.3 multiplied by five gives us 1.5 centimeters. Then you just have to mark a spot on the anywhere on the chromatogram, which is 1.5 centimeters from the origin. So we might want to mark a spot, say here, and label that as Z. So state the precise location of photosynthetic pigment in a chloroplast. Now the word precise is the important bit there. So remember with the chloroplast, you've got an outer membrane, you've got an inner membrane, and then you've got thylakoid membranes. And remember that in the thylakoid membranes, you've got the photosynthetic pigments embedded in the photosystems. So the photosystems, which are embedded in the thylakoid membrane, contain the photosynthetic pigments such as chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, firephytin, etc. And that those are in the thylakoid membranes because the way they work, remember, is that the flow of electrons causes the hydrogen ions to be moved from the stroma into the thylakoid interior. And then they then flow out through ATP synthase, generating ATP. So the answers that they were keen on you putting were that there were photosystems in the thylakoid membranes. When sequencing DNA, fragments of DNA are separated by electrophoresis. Describe three differences between the process of thin layer chromatography and the form of electrophoresis used to sequence DNA. So when you use um, electrophoresis with a DNA sequencing, you're separating the DNA on the basis of size. Some of you might have done this in your school labs. Um, you take a electrophoresis tank, you put in some combs so they create little wells, you pour in a gel, the gel sets, you put in a buffer solution, and then you um, have two electrodes, one at each end, and then you apply a potential difference and the DNA fragments migrate and where they get to depends on the size of the fragment. So you can conclude that the fragment that moved the furthest distance traveled the fastest, therefore it must be the smallest. And then the next biggest is the one that moved the next largest distance. Now, when you're describing differences, it needs to be a comparative statement. So what they were looking for here were things like thin layer chromatography separates by the relative adsorption. That's a hugely important word that they've come up with a lot here. So adsorption or the solubility or the interaction with the stationary phase. Um, whereas it's size in electrophoresis. That's one. Let's go for a second. A second statement could be that thin layer chromatography separates non-charged, whereas electrophoresis only separates charged particles, because it does that by the potential difference that you've applied over the electrophoresis tank. Third difference, you use electricity for electrophoresis. You don't use it for uh, thin layer chromatography. So the difference would be that it's not used for thin layer chromatography. So again, you have to make a comparative statement. You can't just say you use electric 
electricity for electrophoresis, full stop. You have to say, and it's not used for thin layer chromatography. The same with the use of a buffer solution that's used in electrophoresis and not used for thin layer chromatography. And then finally, some fairly niche differences that you could have used, you could have put things like you use dyes, you use fluorescent markers or radioactive nucleotides in electrophoresis. Electrophoresis can be automated and computed, uh, computerized, sorry, whereas thin layer chromatography is not automated. Bread contains a mixture of polypeptides known as gluten. So a polypeptide is a chain of amino acids joined together by peptide bonds. So gluten consists of two types of polypeptide, gliadins, gliadins and glutenins. Hopefully I won't have to say those again. So the table shows, the table below contains statements about the structures of the polypeptides that make up gluten. Now, in the box next to each statement, write the level of protein structure to which each statement refers. Now, looking at the description, they say that you have short alpha helix sections are present because of their high levels of proline. Now, if you have alpha helical sections, those are caused by um, hydrogen bonds, and that gives us the secondary structure. Intermolecular bonds form between the two polypeptides. So glutenin and gliadin, gliadin polypeptides. So bonds form between two chains. So you've got two different chains forming a bond, which gives us a quaternary level of structure. Up to 45% of the amino acids in gliadins are glutamine. Well, that's telling you about the order and sequence and what amino acids are there. So this is the primary structure. And then hydrophobic amino acids, such as glutamine and proline, are not found on the surface of the gluten proteins. So the hydrophobic amino acids want to be away from the water, so they cause the um, structure of the polypeptide to fold in such a way is that those amino acids aren't on the outside on the surface of the protein. So it's causing a change to the three-dimensional folding of that protein, which is the third level or tertiary structure. So the answers the examiner wanted are here. So the first one was secondary and then quaternary and then primary and then tertiary. So celiac disease is caused by an immune reaction to gliadins in a person's digestive system. The immune system produces antibodies that bind to part of the gliadin polypeptides, which causes inflammation. Now, some people who stop eating foods that contain gluten still occasionally experience the symptoms of celiac disease. Now, what can you conclude about the structure of the antibody that causes celiac disease and what the antibody binds to when producing the symptoms of celiac disease? Now, this sort of question, you, you need to think very carefully about what they've told you. Because students tend to think, well, I don't know anything about celiac disease. How can I answer this question? The question is not about celiac disease. And the clues are all here. So they said it produces antibodies that bind to part of the gliadin polypeptides. Now we know that an antibody is a protein and it's got a constant region and then it's got a variable region and the variable region is where that there is an interaction between the antibody and the antigen. So that the part of the gliadin polypeptide is the antigen so the antibody binds to the antigen and that causes inflammation. Now, if some people who stop eating foods that contain the gluten still occasionally experience the symptoms, well, those antibodies are binding to an antigen which is not on the gluten because they're not eating it. 
So what can you conclude about the structure of the antibody that produces celiac disease? Well, the structure is that it's a protein, that it's got a variable region, which is a chain of um, amino acids, and that variable region is complementary to the antigen, and the antigen is the part of the gliadin polypeptide. Now, as it's part of that polypeptide, it'll be a short sequence of amino acids. Now, what if that short sequence of amino acids occurred in other foods? Then you would suffer from the inflammation. So other foods have a similar antigen. The antigen is a short sequence of amino acids, and that may be present in those other foods. And the variable region isn't specific to the gliadin antigen. It may be specific to, um, it may bind to other antigens in other foods, therefore causing inflammation by stimulating the T lymphocytes and getting the mast cells to release the histamine. This question is not about celiac disease. It's about the nature of an antibody and an antigen and the interaction. So gluten helps trap carbon dioxide within bread dough. This enables the bread to rise when it's being baked. Carbon dioxide is produced by baker's yeast. So the carbon dioxide is produced by the baker's yeast, Saccharomyces mycetes cerevisiae. This species of yeast is able to convert ethanol to acetyl-CoA at low glucose concentrations. Now this sentence is absolutely crucial to your understanding of the question. If it can convert ethanol to acetyl-CoA, then the ethanol which is initially produced by anaerobic respiration of the yeast, the ethanol can then be turned into acetyl-CoA, which then, remember, goes into the link reaction and then Krebs cycle, so it can power aerobic respiration. So figure two shows the oxygen consumption and the carbon dioxide production of a population of Saccharomyces cerevisiae grown in batch culture. Batch culture is where you add the um, yeast, you've got the glucose and you add it and leave it to it. You don't add anything and you don't take anything away. So the population was provided with glucose as their only source of, only initial source of carbon. So let's have a look at the graph. So when you get a graph like this, the first thing to do is not to panic. Take a deep breath and spend a few minutes looking at the graph before you look at the question that's associated with it. First thing you need to do is to look at the axes. So on the bottom we've got time in hours and on the left hand side we've got the rate of oxygen consumption and carbon dioxide production and on the right hand side we've got glucose and ethanol concentration. Now with ethanol you need to be thinking well that's the product of anaerobic respiration and glucose is the respiratory substrate that they've given to the yeast. And then you need to look at what happens to the levels of glucose and ethanol as this proceeds. So you can see that the after between zero and four hours, the glucose concentration falls. So we can see the glucose concentration falling to zero. At the same time, you can see that the carbon dioxide production this goes up dramatically and then it falls. So that as the glucose is being consumed, carbon dioxide is being produced and that's supported by when we look at the ethanol, which is the diamonds, we can see ethanol production increasing. Now after about eight or nine hours at this point here, you can see that there's no glucose left. Now they've told you in the question that the um, species of yeast can convert ethanol into acetyl-CoA, which can then go into link reaction and Krebs cycle. So after about nine hours, we can see that the carbon dioxide production begins to rise again, because this is now respiring aerobically. And we can see that the oxygen consumption also goes up. So the carbon dioxide production is here, sorry. And then the oxygen consumption is rising after about nine hours. 
and at the same time we can see that the ethanol concentration is falling because the ethanol is being converted into acetyl-CoA which is being used to drive um, aerobic respiration which is why the oxygen consumption increases because the oxygen is being used in aerobic respiration. So suggest which means apply the concepts that you already know and explain what conclusions that can be drawn from figure two about the factors that affected the rate and the type of respiration carried out in this batch culture. So you should have said that initially the respiration is anaerobic because the glucose is being converted into ethanol and you can see this because the glucose concentration falls here and the ethanol concentration rises. And then the respiration decreases once the glucose has been used up because you see the glucose falls to zero after about nine hours. After that, the ethanol is being used once the glucose has been consumed. And that's the aerobic respiration of the ethanol because the acetyl-CoA is being used in Krebs cycle, which they told you in the question, they told you that this species of yeast could use ethanol converted to acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA then gets used in Krebs cycle. And then rest, finally, the respiration stops when all of the ethanol has been used up. So at the point where the ethanol reaches zero, which is here, then the um, oxygen consumption is also going to fall because then there's no ethanol to be converted to acetyl-CoA, so there can't be any more aerobic respiration. So describe two practical considerations to ensure that the Saccharomyces cerevisiae population grows successfully when the initial culture is established. So describe two practical considerations means what would you actually do in order that the um, population that you've inoculated the glucose with, um, that that grows successfully. So hopefully you would think that you would use aseptic technique to avoid contamination, that you would provide a source of respiratory substrates, that you would incubate at a suitable temperature, you would use a pH buffer, and that you would stir it. So all of these are practical considerations. Scientists wanted to estimate the number of yeast cells in 25 centimeter cubed solution of Saccharomyces cerevisiae. They carried out the following two dilutions. They took one centimeter cubed of the original 25 centimeter cubed solution and mixed it with nine centimeter cubed of nutrient solution to make solution two. They then took one centimeter cubed of solution two and mixed it with nine centimeters cubed to make solution three. They then took 0.1 centimeter cubed of solution three and put it onto an agar plate. They incubated it and they saw that after incubation they had 15 separate colonies growing on the plate. Now they ask you to calculate the number of yeast cells in the original 25 centimeter cubed solution. This technique is known as serial dilution. And what it depends on is that you realize that the 15 colonies came from 15 separate yeast cells, that each yeast cell caused the growth of a single colony. So in the 0.1 centimeter cubed of solution three that you put onto the agar plate, there must have been 15 yeast cells because they produced 15 colonies. Now, in that 0.1 centimeter cubed of solution, in that there were 15, well, how many were there in the previous solution two, and in the previous, sorry, in the previous solution three, and then in the previous solution two, and then working back from that to how many would there have been in the um, 25 centimeter cubed of the solution that they wanted to estimate the number from? So let's have a look at how you could have worked this out.
So the first step is that they took one centimeter cubed from the 25 centimeters cubed and they added it to nine centimeter cubed of nutrient solution. This gives us a total volume of 10 centimeters cubed, which means that the yeast cells that were in the one centimeter cubed are now spread through 10 centimeter cubed in total. That gives us a total dilution of some 10 times. You then take one centimeter cubed from that solution, you add it to a further nine centimeter cubed and spread the cells out through now a total volume of 10 centimeters cubed. So we've now made another tenfold dilution. You then take 0.1 and you add it to the agar plate, leave it overnight to incubate or for a set period of time. And then you see that there are 15 colonies. Now, crucially, you remember that each colony has come from a single cell, which means there must have been 15 cells in the ones in the 0.1 centimeters cubed that you've added. Now that came from a total volume of 10 centimeters cubed. So how many cells were in there? Well, there are 100 lots of 0 0.1 in 10, 10 centimeters cubed. So if we take 15 and multiply by 100, we get 1,500. So there must have been 1,500 yeast cells in the centimeter cubed that we added to the nine centimeters cubed. And where did that came, come from? Well, that came from the one centimeter cubed that we'd taken from solution two. That had come from a tenfold dilution of this one. Now, if we diluted that 10 times and we produced one centimeter cube with 1500 cells in it, then there must have been 15,000 cells in that one centimeter cubed. Now they want you to work out how many were in the original 25 centimeter cube solution. So we need to then take 15,000 and multiply by 25 which gives us 375,000 cells in that one, that 25 centimeters cubed. Now we have to express it in standard form to three significant figures, which is 3.75 times 10 to the five cells in that 25 centimeters cubed. A group of students were designing an experiment to investigate the effect of temperature on the respiration rate of Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Their planned method included the following. They would divide the yeast suspension into six equal volumes. They would test six temperatures. They would control the temperature by placing them in water baths. They would measure the rate of respiration by using a pH probe and they would repeat it four times. Now the question asks you to evaluate whether the student's method is likely to produce valid results. Now valid results means, are you actually going to test what you set out to test? Evaluate means, yes, it will because, and no, it won't because. So you need to think about what have they done right in this experimental design and what have they done wrong? Now, when you're approaching this, you need to think independent variable, dependent variable, controlled variables, a control, and also about the nature of the organism that you're testing. So independent variable, first of all, have they got a sufficient range? Well, yes, they've got six values which is a sufficient range. They're testing an appropriate range, which is 15 to 40 degrees. So the independent variable looks fine. Now, the dependent variable, would you use a pH probe to monitor the change in pH? And would you regard that as an appropriate way of measuring the rate of respiration? Well, firstly, a flaw is, well, how can you measure rate when you don't know the time over which that pH change has occurred, because rate is something per unit time. 
The change in pH might be a result of the production of carbon dioxide causing a lowering of the pH in the ones that are respiring more. But there are better ways of measuring respiration rate, which might be the um, number of bubbles produced, of bubbles of carbon dioxide. You might use an oxygen probe to measure the concentration of oxygen. So what they've used to measure the dependent variable isn't a great method. Now, have they done sufficient repeats? Yes, and that would give us valid results because they have repeated the experiment. Then you've got to think about what variables haven't they controlled that they should have controlled. So as a route into that, you need to think, well, what things affect the rate of respiration? Temperature does, which is your independent variable. But you might think they need to control the concentration of oxygen. They might or need to control the pH of the solutions. Then you need to think, well, have they done a control? Do they know what the pH change is in the absence of the yeast? So it might be that the change in temperature from um, 15 degrees to 40 degrees, that might in itself cause a change in the pH of the solution. So that you're not using a valid method of measuring the rate of respiration change. So the sort of things that they're looking for here is firstly for you to say, why would it be appropriate? So they have used a suitable range of the independent variable. They have controlled volume. They have controlled temperature. They are doing repeats in order to identify anomalies and calculate an average. They are using the same yeast suspension because they've subdivided it. And then you need to think, well, what reasons would there be that it wouldn't produce a valid result? And do things are that they didn't control the availability of oxygen? Did they control the concentration of glucose? They didn't look at what the pH was at the beginning of the experiment. pH change wouldn't be an accurate measure of respiration rate. There's no reference to time and there's no control repeating the experiment in the absence of the living organism to demonstrate that it's the presence of the living organism that's causing the change in the dependent variable. The students used a t-test to compare the results at 30 degrees and 35. They calculated a t-value of 2.2. The critical value for p of 0 0.05 is 2.306. Now, assuming their method is valid, what can they conclude from the results of the t-test? Well, the value for t that they've calculated is lower than the critical value, which is for p is less than 0 0.05, it's 2.306. So the value they've calculated is not higher than the critical value. Therefore, they can conclude that there is not a statistically significant difference between the results of 30 and 35 degrees. So the results are not statistically significantly different and any difference can be explained by chance. You can accept the null hypothesis and accept that the results are not statistically significantly different. So tigers, Panthera tigris, are predatory mammals. That means they eat things. They have evolved striped patterns on their fur, as shown in this picture, for those of you who don't know what a tiger is, which provide camouflage in their habitats. So they've evolved these striped patterns in order that they can be camouflaged from their prey. So the striped patterns enable them to be not seen by they, their prey. So you could think, well, perhaps a tiger which had striped patterns would able, be able to eat more deer than a tiger that didn't have striped patterns because the deer would see the non-striped tiger. So you might think there's an advantage to possessing this adaptation, which is why that adaptation um, evolved and has persisted. Now, the adaptation can be divided into three types. The three types of adaptation, which is behavioral, physiological and anatomical. 
So what's this type? Well, this type of adaptation is anatomical. So describe and explain how a tiger with striped fur may have evolved from a non-striped ancestor. So this describe bit is being specific to tigers and the explain bit is referring to the concepts of evolution. How could you go from a non-striped ancestor to a striped tiger? What would be the selection pressures? Why would have the striped tigers become more common and, and you ended up with a population that was wholly striped tigers? Additionally, they say you should discuss the different types of genes that might be involved in the creation of the striped pattern in the tiger's fur. So you might think perhaps, well, originally tigers might have been all orange and then some of the genes in some of the skin which produces the particular fur colour, some of those genes will be switched off, which gives you the stripiness. So what are you going to talk about there? Well, you need to be talking about the concept of regulatory genes and genes which switch off other genes. Now, looking at the first part of the question, the how you could evolve from a non-striped ancestor. You've got to follow a set pattern with any natural selection evolution question, which says You've got a population. In that population, there is a mutation. That mutation confers an advantage to the organism that possesses it so that that organism has more offspring. Its offspring carry the mutated allele. Therefore, the allele frequency of that mutated allele that causes the striped fur becomes more common in the population over time because there is an advantage to possessing that allele. And you need to be specific in the describe bit um, for this question to say, well, what would that advantage be? Would that it would be more camouflaged and therefore it would be able to um, hunt more successfully. Therefore, it would produce um, more offspring because it'd be able to eat more prey and its offspring would then possess the mutation, which is the stripiness, which which gave its parents success. So then it would also be successful so that over time that the fact that they're camouflaged due to the stripiness will will spread throughout the entire population. So looking at the mark scheme, level three, five to six marks, which I know you're all going to get, you've got to provide a full and accurate description. This means using A-level language of natural selection and describe the role of regulatory genes and mention the role of a structural gene. Well-developed line of reasoning, clear and logically structured, uses scientific terminology at an appropriate level, which is A-level standard, and it's relevant. So let's have a look at those indicative scientific points. So there is a mutation in a gene that causes a pigment um, or change in a pigment or a mutation of a regulatory gene. What's the selection pressure? The selection pressure is being more cryptically coloured um, against the background. Therefore, they can eat more prey. So you've talked about the selection pressure and the adaptation and the advantage of that adaptation is that they were able to survive because they could eat more and they were more likely to reproduce. Those alleles don't refer to genes. It's always the beneficial alleles are passed on to the next generation. Therefore, the allele frequency will increase with each generation because each generation has an advantage. And then after many generations, all of the tigers within a population will be striped. And then on to points that you could have made about the regulatory genes. So what do the regulatory genes do? They control the pattern of where the pigments are produced and control the expression of other genes. They're switched on and off in development and you could have referred to the production of transcription factors or epigenetics. You could have talked about epistasis um, epistasis um, often gives you an example of 
um, a different coloration because you've switched off a gene um, which prevents the expression of a particular uh, protein therefore you don't have a particular pigment one subspecies of tiger is the bengal tiger one in ten thousand bengal tiger births results in a white bengal tiger and they've shown you one in the insert which i've put here the allele that causes white fur is recessive so in order to be expressed you need two copies of the allele and it's the result of a mutation to a gene according to the heidi weinberg principle the following equation can be used to estimate allele frequency within a population if we gave the allele the recessive allele the letter say little r in order to have the uh, mutation in order to have it expressed you need two copies of it now the p plus q equals one means that the frequency of the big r allele plus the frequency of the little r allele equals one now in order to have two um, recessive alleles that means you need to have q and q so the frequency of the um, white bengal tigers will be q times q which is q squared now they tell you it's one in ten thousand which means that the frequency is of q squared equals 0 0.0001 now in order to find q all you have to do is to square root that so if you square rooted q squared you get q which is 0 0.01 you know that p plus q equals 1 therefore you know that p equals 1 minus q which is 1 minus 0 0.01 which is 0 0.99 now they ask you to work out the frequency of the heterozygotes and give the answer to one significant figure so the frequency of the heterozygotes is going to be 2pq and the reason for that is because the heterozygotes can either be that or they can be that so then we've got to work out what is 2pq so 2 times p which is 0 0.99 times q which is 0 0.01 and this will give us a frequency of 0 0.10, sorry, 0 0.0198. Now we have to express it in a percentage to one significant figure. So they've asked you to give it as a percentage. So in order to turn it into percentage, we need to multiply by 100. So we take 0 point zero one nine eight we multiply by a hundred which gives us one point nine eight percent and then we need to express it to one significant figure so the answer is two percent so two percent of the bengal tigers will be heterozygous for the mutation for the mutated allele Complete the table to show the locations of each type of bacterium in the nitrogen cycle and the reactions they perform. The first row, and you have to get each row correct in order to get a mark. The first row refers to rhizobium. Now rhizobium are the genus of um, nitrogen fixing bacteria and they live in association with leguminous plants and their location is that they live in root nodules of leguminous plants. Now, Nitrosomonas and Nitrobacter are both nitrifying bacteria. And Nitrosomonas act on ammonium ions or compounds. And the product is to take ammonium ions and produce nitrite. Now, this is an oxidation step because they're chemoautotrophs. 
So they take the energy from the oxidation of ammonium, use it to make nitrites, and they use that for respiration. Now nitrobacter take the product of nitrosomonas, which is the nitrites, and they turn them into nitrates. And that's another oxidation step. Finally, denitrifying bacteria are common in anaerobic environments. That's environments where you don't have um, much oxygen. So for instance, waterlogged soils. The product of denitrifying bacteria is nitrogen gas. And the denitrifying bacteria use nitrate as the electron acceptor as the last stage in the electron transport chain in a similar way to oxygen accepting electrons and hydrogens to become water in the end of aerobic respiration. So what they're doing here is they're reducing the nitrate to nitrogen gas. Nitrogen fixation is an important part of the nitrogen cycle. The rate of nitrogen fixation is reduced by the presence of oxygen. Now, as soon as you need to see that, you need to think, well, they've told me that for a reason, and it's very important for the second part of the question. Rhizobium uses the enzyme nitrogenase to fix atmospheric nitrogen. We've got a simplified representation of the structure of nitrogenase and the reaction that it catalyzes. So looking at the um, picture that they've shown you, you can see that you've got nitrogen gas um, which is one of the, well, the substrate that's going to be used in the reaction. And it says hydrogen gas can bind instead of nitrogen at the same position. So if it's hydrogen gas occupying the same position as the nitrogen gas, it's occupying the active site. Therefore, you conclude that the hydrogen gas is a competitive inhibitor. However, the carbon monoxide, which is binding to a part of the enzyme which is not the active site, the carbon monoxide must be a non-competitive inhibitor. Additionally, you can see this cluster of molybdenum, iron and sulphur. Well, this would be a prosthetic group because it's a non-protein part of the protein. So it's a prosthetic group or cofactors. Finally, looking at the overall reaction, we can see that you take nitrogen gas, add hydrogen ions, electrons, and ATP. And that ATP is being turned into ADP plus P. So you can see that the reaction requires the input of energy from ATP in order to fix the nitrogen gas, in order to reduce the nitrogen to ammonia. So what can you conclude from figure four about the molecules or ions that affect the functioning of the nitrogenase enzyme? So the first thing to do is to identify the molecules or ions. So molecules that are important here is hydrogen gas, and that can go into the active site of the enzyme rather than the nitrogen gas. You've got carbon monoxide, which can occupy a part of the enzyme that's not the active site, so that's the allosteric site. And then you've got the cluster of molybdenum, iron and sulphur. So now we need to make points about all of those. The other thing that we can make a point about is about the ATP being turned into ADP plus P. So what they're looking for here was for you to say that the iron, molybdenum and sulphur form cofactors or prosthetic groups, that the hydrogen gas is a competitive inhibitor because it occupies the active site, preventing the nitrogen gas from entering, that carbon monoxide is a non-competitive inhibitor because it occupies an allosteric site, that's not the active site. Then you could say a little bit about how it causes a change in the enzyme by occupying the allosteric site and changing the overall shape of the enzyme, therefore changing the active site, therefore preventing the action of the nitrogenase enzyme, that you require um, ATP so you have to put in energy from ATP in order to get the reduction of nitrogen gas to occur. Leg haemoglobin is a molecule that improves the performance of nitrogenase. It has very similar properties to mammalian haemoglobin. 
Now they ask you to suggest two ways in which leg haemoglobin could improve the performance of the nitrogenase enzyme. So in this case, you've got to think, what does haemoglobin do? What does it do in mammals? As it's very similar, how could that help the nitrogenase enzyme? So what, leg, leg hemo, what haemoglobin does in mammals is it has a very high affinity for oxygen. It binds to oxygen and it helps transport the oxygen around your body in your red blood cells. Now suggest two ways in which leg haemoglobin could improve the performance, or perhaps it could supply more oxygen to the rhizobium bacteria. So the rhizobium bacteria could produce more ATP. Now, the next clue was in the question where it said oxygen fixation is reduced by the, sorry, nitrogen fixation is reduced by the presence of oxygen. So now you need to be thinking, well, perhaps the leg haemoglobin, which has a high affinity for oxygen, is going to reduce the presence of oxygen, and that will mean that you can increase the rate of nitrogen fixation because it won't be an inhibitor. So it's going to remove excess oxygen, so there'll be less inhibition of the nitrogenase enzyme. And finally, it could bind to carbon monoxide um, because haemoglobin will bind to carbon monoxide. So you should be thinking, well, maybe leg haemoglobin would bind to carbon monoxide and carbon monoxide occupies the allosteric site. It's a non-competitive inhibitor. So less carbon monoxide, therefore less inhibition of the nitrogenase enzyme. Now, this question really rewards very careful reading. So many species of bacteria act as decomposers within ecosystems by breaking down organic material. Scientists analyzed the energy flow within a grassland ecosystem. They estimated the energy in the decomposer's trophic level was 950,000 kilojoules per meter square per year. The energy within the producer's trophic level was 800 times greater. And that's the crucial word to understanding this question greater than that of the decomposers. Calculate the energy in the producer's trophic level in kilojoules per meter squared per year. Well, they've given you, you the energy in the decomposer's trophic level in joules per meter squared per year. So a kilojoule is a thousand joules. So you've just got to take off the three noughts at the end, and that gives you 950 kilojoules per meter squared per year. Now, they tell you that the energy within the producer's trophic level was 800% greater than that of the decomposers. So you're thinking, yes, I'm just gonna multiply by eight because it's 800% greater. And if I multiply by eight, I get 7,600 kilojoules per meter squared per year. Unfortunately, that only gets you one mark because the correct answer is looking at this, that it has to be 800% greater than the decomposers. So you actually then have to add the energy in the decomposers in order for it to be 800% greater. And that gives you a total of 8,550 kilojoules per meter squared per year because it's 800% greater than the decomposers. So you need to multiply by eight and then add the amount that was in the decomposers because it's greater than that. Um, if you got that wrong, um, don't be ashamed. It took me quite a while to work out what they were asking you to do. Now they ask you to calculate the percentage efficiency of the energy transfer from the producers to the decomposers. And they ask you to give your answer in two significant figures. So you need to take the energy in the decomposers, divide by the energy in the producers, and multiply by 100. So that gives us 950 divided by 8,550, multiplied by 100, which gives us 11.1111%, which is 11% to two significant figures. Now, if you'd used the wrong answer from the previous question, so if you'd got 7,600, and that would give you 12.5%, if you calculated that to, to as 
13%, that is to two significant figures, then they gave you the mark as an error carried forward. But the answer that they wanted here was 11%. Figure 5 is the insert for the next question. When you get an insert, have a look at it before you look at the question and have a good think about what they're trying to get you to think about. So you can see that they've shown you a neuron that's affected by multiple cirrhosis. They've shown you the axons, they've told you they're purple, so you can see that we've got the axons here, here and here. They've shown you the Schwann cells in light blue. And then in black, they've shown you the myelin sheath. So you can see there's a myelin sheath here and here. Now the neuron affected by multiple sclerosis is, has not got the myelin sheath. Now they're expecting you to connect those things and to think, well, what's the myelin sheath for? Well, it's to enable saltatory conduction, which is where the action potential jumps between nodes of Ranvier, which speeds up the speed of the transmission of the action potential. So having had a look at the figure, and having seen the differences, it then makes you think about what the question is then going to ask you. So multiple cirrhosis is an autoimmune disease that causes damage to the nervous system. Suggest how the immune system causes damage to the nervous system. So you need to think a little bit about figure five but mainly you need to think about how and the immune system could cause damage to anything and then apply that concept to multiple cirrhosis. So you need to think, well, the immune system depends on interaction between antigens and antibodies. So where would be the antigens if you were causing damage to the nervous system? Well, the antigens would be on the neurons or in the Schwann cells. So they're expecting you to think that the antigens would be on the neurons or the myelin sheath and that you would then produce antibodies against those neurons or against the Schwann cells and those antibodies would cause phagocytes or neutrophils or macrophages or T killer cells or any part of the immune system to attack or break down the myelin sheath or the Schwann cells or the neurons, therefore damaging it. So in order to answer this question, you didn't know, need to know anything about multiple cirrhosis and you didn't really need to know um, much about autoimmune diseases, but you needed to apply what you knew about the immune system to how that could attack your own cells, which is to talk about the interactions between antigens on the neurons and antibodies produced against those, those um, antigens, which would then cause the immune response. So figure five on the insert shows three neurons of different sizes from a person with MS. One of the neurons has been affected by MS and they tell you, show you which one it is. MS causes changes to the neurons which reduce the speed at which the nerve, nervous impulses are conducted. Using the information, so the information is in the picture, what can you conclude about how MS causes reduction in the speed of the Nervous, nervous impulses. Well, using this, you can see clearly that there is no or little Schwann cells containing the myelin around the neuron which is affected by MS. Therefore, you can conclude that the way it causes reduction in the speed of the nerve impulses is to damage the Schwann cells, having less or incomplete or no myelin sheath and then what's the purpose of the myelin sheath? The purpose of the myelin sheath is saltatory conduction, therefore there'll be no saltatory conduction, therefore that will reduce the speed at which the nerve nervous impulses are conducted. So Guillain-Barre syndrome is another autoimmune condition in which the neurons are damaged and the rate of 
nervous impulses is reduced. Multiple cirrhosis affects the central nervous system, whereas Guillain-Barre syndrome affects the peripheral nervous system. They ask you to suggest two symptoms of MS that might not be present in people with Guillain-Barre syndrome. So this question is not about Guillain-Barre syndrome. It's not really even about MS. It's about the differences between the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. And then linking those differences to how damage to the central nervous system could cause symptoms. So all they're looking for you to do here is to talk about different parts of the central nervous system and what they do and what would be the consequences if they were damaged because they wouldn't do those things that they do. So things that they were looking for you to write here would be things like loss of memory or thinking or cognition due to damage to the specific region of the central nervous system which is the cerebrum or the cerebral cortex. Alternately, damage to the cerebellum which causes changes in balance or coordination which is what the cerebellum does therefore if you damage it that's what your symptoms are so that you'd have loss of balance or coordination damage to the hypothalamus and what does it do well it does feeding sleeping temperature control water balance um, through action of ADH and all that sort of thing swallowing bladder control, bowel movement, heart rate, breathing rate due to damage to the medulla oblongata. So remember the point of this question is it's not about MS, it's not about Guillain-Barre syndrome, it's about what do different, what different parts of the central nervous system do and therefore what would be the sy symptoms if they were damaged. So multiple sclerosis and Guillain-Barre syndrome both cause muscle weakness and loss of muscle function. So suggest and describe how the function of neuromuscular junctions will be affected by multiple sclerosis and Guillain-Barre syndrome. So a neuromuscular junction is where a um, motor neuron junctions with a muscle. Action potentials arrive and that releases neurotransmitter acetylcholine into the neuromuscular junction, which diffuses across and binds to receptors. And then that causes the um, contraction going through the T-tubules and the sarco, uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum and so on. So if you have multiple sclerosis and Guillain-Barre syndrome, you have damage to the myelin sheaths, you reduce the frequency of the action potentials. So if you reduce the frequency of the action potentials, you're going to have fewer action potentials reaching the neuromuscular junction. Therefore, you're going to release less neurotransmitter or less acetylcholine, which is the specific neurotransmitter. And as a result of less of neurotransmitter binding, you'll have less depolarization of the postsynaptic membrane therefore you have um, a loss of muscle function and muscle weakness a student investigated the heart rates of smokers and non-smokers so each test subject had their resting heart rate measured using an electronic heart rate monitor they ran one kilometer on a running track and then they measured their heart rate after running 500 meters. The heart rate was recorded for a third time, three minutes after the completion of the exercise. So they're measuring before, during and after. All of the subjects were 18 years old. They were tested between nine and 4 p.m. on one day. So not at the same time each day. And they were tested one at a time. The tests were repeated one week later, so they've done one repeat on each student and then used those two values to give you a mean heart rate. And then they show you the results below. So let's zoom out and have a look at those results. If we look at the number of smokers that they've got here, then they've got these are all smokers. So they've got a different number of smokers to non-smokers. If we look at the males and females, 
it looks that they've got slightly more females than males. Now you might also think, well, why, if you're going to look at smoking versus non-smokers, surely you should look at just one gender rather than looking at males and females because that is a variable that you're not controlling. Additionally, you might be thinking, well, surely they should have measured it at the same time each day rather than at, during a, a time between nine o'clock and four o'clock. They've only measured it twice per person. Is that enough repeats in order to calculate a mean? Now, in terms of the presentation of the data, surely this would be better shown with smokers in one table, non-smokers in the other, or being shown with a bar chart, or shown females in one, males in the other, um, or some form of graphical representation. So let's have a look at the mark scheme. Suggest and explain improvements that the student could make to his experimental method and his presentation of data. In your answer, you should explain the benefits of your suggested improvements. When you're approaching these questions, always think independent variable, dependent variable, control variables, repeats, and a control experiment. So for five to six marks, you should describe and explain some improvements to the method and the presentation. Some is not defined, so some I would say is three or more. So the indicative scientific points may include, you should increase the sample size. Now, why is that a good idea? It would improve the accuracy and repeatability. So that's suggest the improvement and say why that improvement matters. You should have the same number of smokers and non-smokers or boys and girls. Why would that be a good thing? It would make the comparisons more valid. You should separately look at gender separate from um, smoking and non-smoking because heart rate may show a diff overall difference between the genders. You need to control other factors because they can influence heart rate. So things like exercise, pre-existing health conditions, diet, body mass, because that could influence heart rate. Additionally, the level of smoking, whether somebody is a casual or a very habitual smoker should be controlled because that's a continuous variable rather than a categoric variable, whether they smoke or not. The degree to which they smoke is going to influence their heart rate. They should have standardized the time of day. Why? Because that could influence heart rate. Then, the subject should have been given a particular exercise that required a particular intensity because the effort could have varied. Um, and then additionally, you should have done more repeats before calculating a mean because you only did two repeats and that didn't, wouldn't have enabled you to calculate or to identify anomalies. Now, the presentation in the table is pretty awful. So how could you have improved it? You could have put the smokers and non-smokers in separate columns in order to allow comparisons. You should show that um, you should show units, so mean heart rate. You should show the number of significant figures or number of decimal places should be the same in the table. You could have prevent, presented the data in a graph to spot the trends and you should have labeled it as mean heart rates rather than just heart rates. So many organisms have evolved specialized gas exchange surfaces. One feature of these structures is their large surface area to volume ratio. Describe how Crucial word there is how the structures of the insect tracheal system and the fish gills provide a large surface area for gas exchange. So the insect tracheal system, you have a spiracle which branches and branches and branches into a huge number of tracheoles which end in each cell. Because you've got a huge number, that means you've got a very large surface area. Fish gills, well on each gill filament, you have gill plates or gill lamellae which again 
have an enormous surface area because you've got a huge number of them. So they were looking for you to say that crucially there were many tracheoles, the crucial word there is many tracheoles which give you a large surface area and the fish has many gill lamellae or gill plates which gives it a very large surface area for gas exchange. So the lugworm Arinicola marina is a species of segmented worm that lives in burrows in damp sand. Now that should leap out at you. Why on earth have they told me that? They have hair-like external gills that increase the surface area available for gas exchange. Many other species of segmented worm do not have the external gills. So suggest why lugworms have evolved external gills. Well, they've evolved external gills in order to give them a larger surface area for gas exchange. You might want to think, well, why might that be? Well, perhaps it's something to do with the phrase lives in burrows in damp sand. Because they live in burrows in damp sand, perhaps they have oxygen in short supply because their habitat is different. Additionally, you might think why they have evolved um, external gills is that the rate of diffusion is too slow. They might have a smaller surface area to volume ratio because they might be quite large or they might have a higher metabolic rate. Now, this is the point that they thought you were going to get, and the other points here were additional points that you would have got credit for to get your one mark. So mammals use lungs for gas exchange. The following passage describes how gases are moved in and out of the lungs. Complete the passage using the most appropriate words or phrases. So when air enters the trachea, mucus secreted by blank cells, traps, dust and microorganisms. So what are those cells called? They are called goblet cells. Air diffuses through the bronchi and the bronchioles. Smooth muscle in the bronchioles relaxes during the fight or flight response. This response is produced by the sympathetic nervous system, which contains neurons that secrete the neurotransmitter. So what does the sympathetic nervous system secrete during the fight or flight response, well, it secretes noradrenaline. During inspiration, both the blank and the external intercostal muscles contract, well, that would be the diaphragm. The internal intercostal muscles only contract when expiration is either forced or conscious or voluntary. That's the end of the paper. I uh, hope you've enjoyed this and I hope you found it useful. Good luck with your exams.